Hello and uh, hello and good evening and welcome to the quarter hour with Sid Yiddish. This is program six, week six of the uh, quarter hour. Um, and of course, I'm your humble host, Sid Yiddish. Uh, welcome you, welcoming you all to my show. Um, would like to say a few things uh, that ha has uh, uh, passed by me and come to my attention um, and of course there's some just some general things I'd like to say in general or generally say in general right <laughs> okay well so uh, first things first uh, as some of you may or may not know uh, this is actually uh, National Care Bears Share Your Care Day which I will um, get to something a little bit later on in the program about that. It's also National Teddy Bear Day and it's also National National Wiener Schnitzel Day. So if you got a Wiener Schnitzel go and share it with someone. Um, if you have a teddy bear share it with someone. And of course it's Care Bear Share Your Care Day. So share your care with a Care Bear and who knows if it's a your bear could refer to anything or anybody on this planet. So, uh, having said that, uh, we move into the next thing. And reading in the news today, I see worldwide uh, coronavirus cases have shot up past 900,000. Um, thank you, President Trump, for being a contributor. The same guy who's just... Um, Nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by some Norwegian guy for brokering a deal between the Israelis and um, the, uh, uh, the United Arab countries. I, I don't know how I feel about that, but um, that's, I guess that's neither here nor there. Uh, in any event, uh, I want to wish... Uh, Happy birthday tomorrow to my uh, partner in crime, Hectic Head in Adelaide, Australia. Um, I believe he is turning 38 or 39, I think. I can't remember anymore. All right. Uh, yes, it is, uh, uh, it is Wiener Bear Day, um, Mr. Baldrich. Thank you. Uh, okay, so... Uh, these next two things, uh, I don't know how to, I, I don't know how to express this as well as I should, but um, some of you who uh, lived in the Chicago area for many years before maybe you moved out, I don't know, some of you were in the poetry scene, maybe not. Uh, last weekend, uh, Kevin Kaiser, a poet who used to read at, um, a poet who used to read at the Heartland Cafe and he he hosted a ton of other places um, in the Chicago area, passed away, I believe he was in his late 50s, early 60s. Um, I don't know what the cause was, but um, he published me at some point, and I can't remember. It might have been when I was in my 30s or my 40s, I, I don't remember when. And lastly, um, for uh, many people, uh, school has started, and that means either remote learning or um, or learning in person. So, um, obviously, um, please be careful uh, if you're driving. And, um, you know, because children are everywhere, especially in the dark. It's uh, certainly getting dark here in the Chicagoland area and other parts of the country, uh, East Coast, um, it's probably already dark, and uh, probably the southern coast, too. It's probably really dark, too. Um, but I want to say, most of all, um, slow down, because um, lives are at stake. Having said that, I want to wish a uh, um, quick recovery to the Reverend High Priestess, uh, Priest, uh, Priestess Pucci, 
out of Gainesville, Florida. She was in a terrible, terrible car wreck about three weeks ago. Um, she broke her left arm and a vertebrae in her back due to a guy speeding about 55 miles an hour while she was stopped at a stoplight. So um, I really hope that um, she recovers uh, quick because we need her um, to be back where she belongs and um, and also for her um, her partner to uh, you know give him a little less worry um, yeah okay so um, priestess I hope you recover soon uh, let's dive right into it uh, I have this first one is one of my poems and uh, this is called two timing seagull oh never trust a two timing seagull there's a two timing seagull down at the pierhead sat atop a luggage rack looking for a friend awfully lonely for a big white bird that cries out in the middle of the day just looking for a sucker to take him in that he will knowingly abandon some hours later for a bag of chips or something even tastier. So why bother and don't even try when you hear him cry out in that sea-bound wail? For all it takes is one little stale piece of bread to forget your comforting words and make him fly away. Oh, never trust a two-timing seagull. All right. Um, and so moving along here, uh, this is uh, a poem by my good friend Shane Bugby. Uh, this is his book. It's from the Joys of Satanism, which is right there. You see it right there. Okay, so this poem is called Satanism Is. Satanism is self-encouragement, to be self against all odds, to continue to grow self to the dirt, surrounding self with excellence and those who surround themselves with excellence. No crab pot mentality lifting the lower higher, the higher lifting the lower, a symbionic stratification. Okay. All right. Once again, that is by Shane Bugby, and this is from the Joys of Satanism, which is a it's a great book. Don't worry, I'm not becoming a Satanist just yet, but I think Shane is hoping I do. So this is the next book I'm going to read from. Next poem, uh, and this is a dozen cold ones by uh, uh, Eddie Two Rivers, uh, the late Eddie Two Rivers, who's a poet here in Chicago. This is the book right here. And this poem is called Working Man's Lament. You stood on State Street in the night and watched the moon race behind angry gray clouds. The wind slapped you hard and stinging. Nobody speaks. They look at you and pass by. One or two shudder. A few dare that second look. You're no party life. Life charted a different course for you. Your hands are the hands of a working man. Calloused and gnarled, fingers stiff from toil and hurting. Yours is the wounded soul of the worker, bitten and blistered. Pain shows in your eyes. Fear shatters a shy smile that adorns. For the briefest, briefest of moments, your tired-looking face your nerves vibrate like the roaring machinery that you build. You feel wounded like a dog soldier in a senseless war on poverty. A willing wage slave, your spirit energizes the giant motors of the industrial monsters. And yet machinery is your source of dignity that leads, that lets you be a contributing member of society a status quo factor dancing a hazy dance of contradictions. But what about the man who owns the machinery? 
You've never seen him, you say, but you know him so well. Flashes from his wheel welding machines seared the retinas of your eyes. The roar of his engines deafens your ears. Your headaches from the high-pitched whine of steel on steel. Your muscles are tensed and sore from carrying his tools. Your back hurts from lifting his products. His profits has torn the heart from your chest. Flies devour flesh in gaping wounds. Your calloused hands, dripping of oil, push back thinning hair on your head. And again, um, this is a uh, book by uh, the late uh, Eddie Two Rivers called A Dozen Cold Ones. And there it is right there. All right. And uh, now we shall move on to the uh, next poet, of course. Um, this is my old friend and a very good buddy of mine uh, by the name of uh, Wes Hine. And this is from his unpublished book of, called Sugar Skull Poems, Flash, and Flash, Flash Fiction. Um, but I think he calls it Sugar Skull Poems, Flash Fiction. Anyway, this is a poem. I don't know how much time we're going to have here, but I, we might get lucky and read two more. We'll see what, what my time permits here. Um, this one is called Grandma's House. Her house was a drawer full of ticket stubs, pieces of board games, participation ribbons, and pesos kept as souvenirs. It was a crumbling attic of dusty rifles, boxes of clothes, clothes, one clarinet, a toy train set, and a blue bowling ball. We had stepped into the kitchen of Grandma's house, ready to eat a nice home-cooked meal as she told us the family's medical history. She always expected us to keep up to date on our relatives' ailments. Perhaps she wanted me and little Jimmy to grow up to be doctors. The place smelled of mothballs, but I always imagined that this was the smell of the 1940s and that the air was merely trapped inside from back then. But now inside, all was quiet. The sun squiggled its way through the yellow nicotine-stained windows. Ma! Hey, Ma! belched Dad. He stood there, turning for a while, in his long fleece overcoat, perhaps expecting to hear her waking. I stood there, feeling dumb with my scalp still hurting from Mom combing my hair in the wrong direction. Then little Jimmy said, I found her, I found her, I win. In the den cloaked in Afghans and shadows was a lumpy slightly out of place on the easy chair. Dad didn't cry, so neither did we. Mom seemed to be most upset. As Dad called our aunts and uncles, Mom sat down next to the old woman, crying silently. I thought that was strange, since she was the only one, one of us not related to her by blood. But maybe they were more similar than I thought. They both loved us and loved Dad, and they both took care of us. Then I thought of losing my mom one day. And I started to tear up, so I finally went over to my mom and crawled into her arms. And this one is called Joe Crow. Joe could be see seen around town on his paper route or collecting cans. His tongue would be sticking out sideways and his eyes swimming around. In a town full of dopey characters, Joe was something else. He was in his early twenties, but he played with sticks and rolled down grassy hills. Once, my little metal, metalhead friends and I were mucking around on our bikes, looking for a place to smoke weed, when Joe Crow chased us down. 
He turned slightly, put his hand to his mouth, and made a static noise like he was on a walkie-talkie. Then he said, those are my men. They're coming for you guys. Shut up, Joe. Yeah, get the fuck out of here, Joe. One day I was driving with my dad, and we passed Joe as he was talking to a Christmas tree that was left on the curb. There's Joe Crow, I said. Joe Crow, asked my dad. That boy's still alive? Yeah, he's something like the village idiot. But my dad didn't laugh, and my dad likes to, loves to laugh. In fact, he got serious. I worked with his father, Brett, at the steel yard. This was before you were born. I was at the bar when Brett came in. He had just he had just had a baby, so we were all surprised to see him out. He was crying and shaking. He couldn't put two words together. Finally, after a few stiff shots of rye, Brett explained he had hired a babysitter for his baby Joe while he was working the night shift. Apparently, Joe wouldn't stop crying, so the baby put the little baby in the microwave and turned it on. I told my friends not to swear at Joe anymore, even if he was annoying. Okay, that was, um, again, that was uh, two poems, uh, Joe Crow and Grandma's House from Sugar Skull Poems, Flash Fiction by Wesley Hine, or Wes Hine, as I like to call him. No, why, I just do. Sometimes I like to call people by their formal names and other times I don't. But he's still West to me. Um, okay, so we are now a little pe bit past the first quarter hour. And um, I've been thinking about how, um, how people feel about things these days and uh, what's going on in the world. And uh, it really is a sad brown world out there. And... Um, uh, Sometimes we like to discuss our feelings, and sometimes we don't. So um, I thought I would read a couple of um, a couple of chapters from this book, which is published by American Girl, and it's called The Feelings Book. You see that right there? That's it right there. And I thought I would read a couple of chapters uh, from it. And uh, the one I'd like to start out um, is... Call, it's, a, it's the chapter called The Voice Inside. And I'll try to show you some pictures if I can. Down here. We're getting there. Okay. Okay, so this is The Voice Inside. So you can see there, there is The Voice Inside right there. Ever think about what your thoughts say to you? Sometimes they tell you things about yourself. I'm a pretty good artist. Or other people. I don't think Emma likes me. Or even what might happen at that party tomorrow. I don't think anyone's going to talk to me. Some of your thoughts may be true, but others are definitely not. Learning to understand and train that voice in your head can help you feel strong and confident. And deal with tough times when they come your way. So the first one is called Listening In. Your inner voice usually chatters away in a pretty calm fashion, but if you're upset, your thoughts get more emotional and can make things seem worse than they are. Positive voice. When you're happy, proud, excited, or pleased, the messages you give yourself are usually positive. Confident voice. When you feel good, the voice in your head reminds you of things you like about yourself or of compliments others have given you. These thoughts can give you confidence to try new things and help you do well. Upset voice. Now here's the opposite. When you are sad or disappointed about something, however, your thoughts can get out of control. When you're upset, your thoughts can turn negative and your fears can become exaggerated just because you flubbed your social studies test doesn't mean you're dumb. Maybe you were distracted because you stayed up too late last night. Maybe you need a new way to study when you're angry or sad. 
That voice in your head may not be telling you the truth. It can call you names and tell you lies. Before you jump to conclusions, remind yourself that negative voice may be picking up on your fears and making you feel worse. Understanding the circle. So it's, it's a really big circle. So when you're upset, believing all the negative thoughts whizzing through your brain can make you feel worse. It can even affect how other people treat you. This is how many of us convince ourselves that the negative voice in our head is right. But when you believe that voice, you can become your own worst enemy. So this is the example on the next page. So I'll show you the next example here. Um, and so we we'll flip over and so so you can change the circle changing your negative thinking can affect how others react to you and how you feel about what is going on so here's how you can change a negative th thought stop it short catch those negative things you say to yourself and hit the off button Use a signal to remind yourself. Clap your hand, snap a rubber band on your wrist, or even say, stop, right out loud. Then distract yourself with another activity, such as reading or calling a friend. Replace it. Think about the possible reasons your friends have acted the way they did. Did they not have the time to call you? Did they try to call you but couldn't get through? There may be lots of reasons. It's often best to assume things are fine and go on. Remind yourself that friends can do things separately and still like each other. Check it out. If a negative thought keeps nagging at you, find out if it's really true. Suggest an activity you and your friends can do together. If it still feels as things aren't right, ask one of your friends privately if he or she is upset. Do what you can to make things right. Then forgive yourself and them. And remember, you have other friends you can do things with, too, when things are strained. Okay, so uh, that's all the time we have for um, in the uh, Feelings book, because we're moving right along here. Uh, and we'll get to that next week. We will get to it next week. It's a good little book, even sometimes for older adults like us. Sometimes we need a reminder of things. I think so, anyway. Um, so, we're going to uh, read, this is from Ladybird Tales, and this book is a, fa is a fairy, fairy tale time story. It's a Grimm's, Grimm's uh, uh, Grimm Brothers tale. It, this is uh, Hansel and Gretel, so I'm going to read from Hansel and Gretel. And this is the little hardcore version. It's a little more hardcore. Once upon a time, there were two children, a boy called Hansel and a girl called Gretel. They lived with their father and stepmother in a little cottage at the edge of, edge of a forest. Their father was a woodcutter, and he was very poor. One day, he had so little money that he could no longer give his family enough to eat. That made him very unhappy. How can we feed the children, he asked his wife one night. We have just enough for two, but not for four. Well, there's, there's the dad, and there's Hansel and Gretel playing with, looks like a prairie dog. I think you can see that right there. His wife did not really like the children. I know what we must do, she replied. Tomorrow we will take the children into the thickest part of the forest. Then we must leave them there. They will never find their way home. We shall be free of them. I can never do that, said the woodcutter. How can you even think of such a thing? You fool, his wife cried. Then all four of us will die of hunger. The woodcutter's wife gave him no peace until at last he agreed. And that's what's going on there. Too hungry to sleep, Hansel and Gretel overheard what was said. Gretel cried bitterly. Don't worry, said Hansel. I will look after you. Once his parents were asleep, he crept quietly outside, 
White pebbles lay all around like silver coins in the moonlight. He filled his pockets with them and went back to bed. Early next morning, the woodcutter's wife wakened the two children. We are going into the forest to chop wood, she told them. Check it out. That guy's pretty smart, you know. I'm talking about Hansel, of course. As they walked away, Hansel kept glancing back at the cottage. Hansel, why are you lagging behind, asked his father. My white cat is on the roof, father, said Hansel. I'm trying to say goodbye. It's the sun shining on the white chimney, you silly boy, said his stepmother. But Hansel wasn't really looking at a cat. Each time he stopped, he dropped a pebble from his pocket onto the path. That's what he's doing. When they came to the middle of the forest, the woodcutter said, I will make you a fire so you won't be cold. We are going to chop wood, their stepmother said. We will come for you when we are ready. Hansel and Gretel sat by the fire. They waited for their parents to come. They waited so long that they fell asleep. When they woke, it was dark. Gretel was frightened. Wait until the moon comes up, Hansel comforted her. Then we will find our way home. And there they are. They are right there. At last the moon rose in the sky. Hansel took his sister's hand and followed the pebbles he had left on the path. They shone like silver coins in the moonlight and, show, and showed the children the way home. You naughty children, scolded their stepmother. Where have you been? The woodcutter was very happy to see them. It had broken his heart to leave them in the forest. Before long, the family had very little food again. One night, the children heard their stepmother talking to their father. We have half a loaf of bread left, she told him. Once that is gone, we will have nothing. We must take the children deeper into the forest. This time they must not find their way home. The woodcutter's heart was heavy. He would rather have shared his last crust with his children, but his wife would not listen to his pleading, and again he had to agree. As soon as the woodcutter and his wife were asleep, Hansel got, got up to fill his pockets with pebbles as before. But his stepmother had locked the door. Sadly, he went back to bed. Don't cry, Gretel, he said bravely. All will be well, you'll see. Early next morning, the stepmother wakened the children. Before they left for the forest, she gave them each a very small piece of bread. As they walked through the trees, Hansel lagged behind and stopped every now and then. Hansel, why do you keep stopping, his father asked. I'm looking back at my little dove, Hansel replied. He's nodding goodbye to me. That isn't a dove, you foolish boy, said the stepmother. It's the sun shining on the chimney. But Hansel wasn't looking at the dove. Each time he stopped, he dropped it, a crumb of bread onto the path. The woodcutter's wife led the children to a part of the forest they didn't know. Stay here, she told them. We're going to fetch, we're going to the, into the forest to cut wood. We'll fetch you in the evening. That's what he's doing. At noon, Gretel shared her piece of bread with Hansel, and they lay down to wait. But when the evening came, evening arrived, sorry, no one came. Don't be afraid, Gretel, Hansel said. When the moon comes up, we will see the crumbs of bread I dropped. They will lead us home. Soon the moon shone, but they couldn't see any crumbs. The birds had eaten them all. Hansel and Gretel walked all night and all next day, and they were still deep in the forest. They were so tired they could go no further, and they lay down under a tree to sleep. There they are. Next morning, the children walked on. They were very hungry. By midday, Hansel felt they must get help soon or they would die of hunger. Just then, a beautiful white bird perched on a nearby branch. It sang so sweetly that they followed it as it flew through the trees. The bird led them straight to a little cottage. Look, Hansel, cried Gretel. 
The cottage is made of bread and cakes, and the windows are made of sugar. There we go. Hansel broke off a piece of bread. Gretel took a bite from one of the cakes. Soon they were both munching happily. Just then the door opened and out came an old woman walking on crutches. Hansel and Gretel were so frightened they dropped what they were eating. But the old woman smiled at them. Come in, children, she said. She led them inside the little cottage. A meal of pancakes, milk, and fruit lay ready on the table. In the back room were two little beds. After they had eaten, the children lay down, happy to be safe at last. <laughs> I don't think so. Hansel and Gretel did not know the old woman was really a wicked old witch who trapped children. She couldn't see very well, but she had a fine sense of smell. She could smell children coming. The house of bread and cakes had been built to tempt children in. The witch gave an evil laugh. These two shall not escape, she cackled. Early next morning, the witch pulled Hansel from his bed and locked him in a cage. Although he screamed, there was no one there to help him. That's what she's doing. Gretel came next. Get up, you lazy girl, screeched the witch. Cook something good for your brother. He will stay in the cage until he is fat enough for me to eat. Gretel began to cry, but the wicked witch only laughed at her tears. Day after day passed. Gretel was soon tired out, for the witch made her clean up and scrub, cook huge meals for poor Hansel. Every morning the witch went up to the cage. Hold out your finger, Hansel, she would cackle. Let me feel if you are fat enough to eat. There we go. But Hansel would, would hold out a bone instead. The witch had such bad eyesight that she always thought it was his finger. She wondered why it grew no fatter. Four weeks passed because of Hansel's clever trick. The witch thought he was still very thin. Soon she lost her patience. Fetch some water, Gretel, she shrieked angrily. This morning I will kill Hansel and cook him. The tears, down, the tears ran down Gretel's face. First of all, we'll bake some bread, the old witch said with a sly look at Gretel. I have already made the dough and heated the oven. She pushed, she pushed Gretel up to the oven door. Go on, said the witch. See if it's hot enough. Then we'll pull the bread in. We'll put the bread in. But she really planned to put Gretel in the oven to bake. Then she would eat the little girl as well as Hansel. Gretel had guessed what the wicked witch was thinking. I can't go in there, she said. I'm too big. You silly child, the witch said angrily. Look, I could even get in myself. She bent down and put her head into the oven. Gretel gave her a hard push and she fell right inside. Yeah, that's it. That's pretty cool. Shutting the iron door, uh, Gretel bolted it. The witch couldn't get out. Gretel ran to Hansel's cage. The witch is dead, she cried. We're safe. Now I must get you out of that cage. Gretel couldn't find the key, so she broke the lock with a poker from the fireplace. The door swung open. Hansel, Hansel sprang out like a bird from a cage. They hugged one another over again and over again. Hugged one another over and over again. <laughs> now they had nothing to fear. And when they looked over the witch, witch's house, they found caskets of pearls and precious stones. He's out of the cage. These are better than pebbles, said Hansel, as he put many into his pockets as, as they would hold. Gretel filled, her, Gretel filled her apron. They left the witch's cottage and walked away from through the trees. It was dark in the forest, but when they were lost, the friendly birds and animals showed them the way. At last, Hansel and Gretel came to a part of the forest they knew. 
They began to run and at least and at last came to their own home. Inside they ran into their father's arms. He had he had, had not one happy moment since the children had been left in the forest. He was all alone now, for their stepmother had died. I'm so glad you've come home, he said. And there it is, the happy reunion. That's the way it should be. Happy reunions. Gretel shook out her apron, and pearls and diamonds rolled all over the floor. Hansel threw out one handful after another from his pockets. Their troubles were over. From then on, the woodcutter and his children all lived happily ever after. And that, my friends, is the end of the story. And that's Hansel and Gretel. Watch out for those crazy witches, you know, those crazy witches. They, um, you know, they do things that... Um, they do things that are evil and naughty and bad. So, uh, we've gone a little bit over time. It is uh, 36 minutes after the hour, the second quarter hour of the uh, program. And so, um, I want to thank you always for, uh, for listening. And uh, 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 for watching and for listening. Uh, again... Uh, the uh, show next week oh, will be on a little bit later on Tuesday night. Um, I've got something preempting it uh, for myself. Uh, so for all of the, those, for those of you who are in the evening, have a good evening. And uh, for those of you in the afternoon, like say, uh, I don't know, uh, Alaska or even uh, the early, early afternoon could still be Alaska and maybe Russia or who knows where, Japan maybe. Um, have a good afternoon. And if you're in the morning, like say Denmark or Germany, good morning to you. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now.